explosion, boys of Papa, my own ears. But I can't decide to abide by the laws that I know in my heart. I am dear. Here you come again. You are allowed to reach the time till you shout. For now, let's welcome a wonderful speaker, my very favorite verbal sparring partner, and a great friend of the Salt Lake Center for Spiritual Living, Reverend Donald Graves. Okay, on this one, the 1030 service, uh, the second service, or whatever the label is for it, wherever the community is, is always a little bit more consistent with the notes that I put down to offer in my message. So who knows what happened at the earlier service, but I had a great time. Um, there was this little girl who went to her mom and asked the question, how did the human race appear? And she said, well, God created Adam and Eve, and they had children, and the human race came from their children. Oh, okay. A couple of days later, she went to her dad and said, Dad, how did the human race appear? The dad said, well, there were monkeys, and the monkeys evolved into human beings. Wow, okay. So she went straight back to her mom and said, Mom, I am really confused. You said we all came from God, the human beings came from God. Dad said human beings evolved from monkeys. Which is it? She says, oh, honey, this is easy to explain. I described how my family evolved. He was talking about his. I knew most of the women would really like that one. <clears throat> so I'm going to kick off with a quotation. Losing an illusion. Losing an illusion is way wiser than finding a truth. So giving up your precious opinions will move you light years ahead and moving forward in truth. Now, you know there are three truths, yours, mine, and the. Well, what is the truth? I will be sharing with you today some truths, and how many of you here have ever heard me speak before? Whoa, that's a lot. I thought I recognized a lot of faces out there. Good to see you all. We had a great time at the Big Sky Retreat this last week, and I see some people who were there. Thank you, Bernie and Joanne, for helping making it marvelous, and Farrell, and Mary, and who else was there? I'm missing anybody? Gordon and Golda were there. Jim was there. Thank you, thank you. I see you back there. Oh, yep, Jean, thank you. So we had a great time, and um, I'll be sharing a couple of quotes that I found from that retreat one which I had never seen before uh, a little bit later in the talk. Let's kick it off with some Bertrand Russell. Most of the greatest evils that a man has inflicted upon man have come through people feeling quite certain about something which in fact was false. How many things have you found out later were not true? 
Yeah. Could have been who you married. <laughs> could have been from a politician. They could have been from what you were taught in school or in the church of your youth or whatever. And you discovered that there were things that you had thought were true that were not. Now, how many of those things did you intuit just didn't make sense? Okay. So this is where the next quotation from the Buddha comes. It's a series, actually. Do not believe in anything simply because you have heard it. Great idea. Do not believe in anything simply because it is spoken and rumored by many. Do not, do not believe in anything simply because it is found written in your religious books. Do not... Jumped too quick. There we go. Do not believe in anything merely on the authority of your teachers and elders. You know, this might be one exception. Um, don't, but, but don't believe what I say. Do not believe in tradition simply because they have been handed down for many generations. And this is the one that catches us a lot. It's the previous one and this one that catches most people and shoves them into a dark, well, seemingly, shoves them into a dark alley that goes nowhere. But after observation and analysis... When you find that anything agrees with reason, and reason is bigger than just the thinking thing, it's, it's logical, it lands, it seems true, it feels true intuitively as well, and is conducive to the good and benefit of one and all, then accept it and live up to it. He didn't just say, just believe it. He didn't just say, accept it. He said, accept it and live up to it. So I was musing a little bit ago about some the, re the realization that if I really, really applied everything I knew about physical health and well-being, I would be in a whole lot better physical shape than I am today. I'd be in better physical shape than I was 10 years ago. But do I apply what I know about that? So I ask you, do you apply what you know? That was pretty simple, wasn't it? If you applied everything you know, you wouldn't have any challenges in your life, right? No. <laughs> you would. But those challenges, challenges wouldn't subsume. They wouldn't completely take over. How many of you have ever felt powerless in your life? Anybody ever felt like a victim? Anybody ever felt at the effect of? Anybody felt like conditions were bigger than you? Oh good, we're in the right room together. This is called being human. But if we could stay in our, I'm gonna call it my, our right mind instead of our left weird mind, our right mind about anything in our life, we could extract ourselves from that burden, that point of view, that experience, the belief that conditions live us, that conditions are in charge of us, and start realizing that we do not have to live a condition-driven life, but rather can live a vision-driven life, a, um, an inner power-driven life. Now, the title of today's talk is Moving Forward as the Future You, is how it looks, it looks in your bulletin. That's not the talk I'm going to give. The talk I'm going to give is moving forward as your future you. How many of you have ever lived somebody else's life? If you were ever this big, you lived somebody else's life because you didn't have a clue what your life was yet. Or you had already been trained out of it. Every single one of us have gone through this. I can remember in an English 1A class when I was, uh, finally got serious about going to college. And the class was um, essay, and the, the, the focus that he used, the metaphor he used for that whole class was metaphor. So one of the assignments was to turn in that next day an essay on some major, some significant event in your life. And so, like normal, the class was at 8 o'clock in the morning. So like normal, I set my alarm for 3 o'clock and I got up and I wrote my paper. 
That's just sort of how I've done everything in my life. You know, you don't want to start off doing anything until you have the most current information, do you? <laughs> now, some people call that procrastination. That's not my point of view. My point of view is I don't want to do anything unless I have the most current data. So I waited until 3 o'clock in the morning to wake up. And when I woke up, I had this remembrance pop into my head that I hadn't thought about. Well, at that point in time, it would have been about 25 years. It was my first birthday party. And my experience sitting there in that high chair prison in Rising Star, Texas, with my dad putting a white birthday cake in front of me with one candle on it burning, and the sun is just blasting on me, and I'm this sweating mess, terrible discomfort. But I knew my dad wanted me to put my hands in that cake. I had no desire to it. I was kind of prissy. I wasn't going to put my hand in that mess. I knew it turned into a concrete, awful experience. But because they wanted me to, my mom and my dad both expected it of me, I did. And moments later, I proved to myself in that moment, I knew exactly what that crusty experience would be like and what would cause it. I knew. I ended up finishing that paper by saying, what else can I be for you? Who can I be for you? I'll dance and dance and smile and smile. Who can I be for you? Now, when I had that experience writing that paper, I knew I couldn't live like that. Now, that was at one year old. Can you change something that you're subsumed in? Can you change the water of your life if you don't know you have an option? This means no, this means yes, this means I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know if I can or not, right? Until I realize or remember or somebody says, you can change your life, you're not stuck with anything. You ever heard that around here? And have you ever felt stuck in your life? Have you ever felt like you didn't understand, have a clue, much less the experience of true prosperity? And what I mean by prosperity is living in that feeling of possibility. That opportunity is waiting right there. It's just waiting to be accepted. So I'm going to give you the secret to having any life you want. Two guidelines, and that's it. Two rules. One, you've got to know what it is that you want. Now, that's hard enough sometimes, but this afternoon in the workshop, we'll talk about how to know what that is. The second thing is you have to accept that into your life. You have to accept it into your experience. Now, how easy is it to accept what you really want in life into your experience? Piece of cake, right? No? You're kidding me. Is that You, you don't get to accept the stuff you really want in your life um, like here in Salt Lake? Don't you get to do that? It can be challenging sometimes, can't it? Because when we've been told what we should do, how we should do, what we should have, and what have you. And it's real easy to live that powerless-oriented life where you don't have the power or the authority to get what you want. And here you are. We teach this as an expression of infinite power itself. Here you sit in that chair as an expression of the infinite intelligence of the cosmos, of the universe. Do you believe it? Well, kind of. Should I believe it? Yes. Why should you believe that you have within you the infinite power of the universe? Why should you believe that you have within you the intelligence of the universe? Because you do. And that this activity, the multi-minds of us, it's like I was hearing all those voices plus all my voices simultaneously. I have a choir. <laughs> Mormon Tabernacle Choir got nothing on this head. <laughs> it ain't a committee. It's a company. It's a corporation, an international corporation. You know how many employees they have? And they're all talking too. I don't understand why we can't understand that we have power over our minds, except that I don't feel like it sometimes. Sometimes we experience life otherwise. <clears throat> I 
So, we, talk, we looked at Buddha's quote about believing anything if it you know, adheres to reason, and it seems true to us, and if it does, then we believe it and we act according to it. So let's test this idea on your belief system. Everything in God's creation is perfect. Anybody here not believe that? A few people don't believe that. Good. That's a thinking mind. If we don't see our own perfection, it's because our attention is focused on our story. Anybody here have stories? Oh, that's good. Whew. We'll have some work to do this afternoon. This is going to be fun. The lies in our story keep us from seeing the truth. But with awareness, we can change the story and return to the truth. That's what we're going to be do this, doing this afternoon. Now, you're going to get everything you need right here. And if you're not really sure that you have everything you need right here, then you show up at 2 o'clock. Actually, you can stick around after the service and enjoy it for lunch and then come in here at 2 o'clock. That works better since lunch is included. Earlier than 2 o'clock. We're starting at 2, right? How many of you know that I'm the time Nazi? <laughs> Mary knows. Lynn knows. I start on time. Otherwise, we're here till 7, 8, 9, 10 o'clock tonight. Yeah. So, you already are and have everything you need in order to become who you came here to be. You already are everything you need to be. You already have everything you need to be in order to become who you came here to be. But the word become is an interesting word. It's an interesting verb. Become, by its very definition, means you ain't it yet. Now that's just weird. We have in our language proof and evidence and repeated information that says you are becoming instead of you already are whole, perfect, complete, as you is, nothing's missing. So how many of you believe you're perfect? Anybody not believe you're perfect? It's okay. Raise your hand. If you don't believe you're per not perfect, that's good. That we, we, we have something to work with. If you don't believe you're perfect, I'm here to awaken you to the fact that you already are. Now, I know all those metaphysical people say, yeah, I'm perfect just the way I am, blah, blah, blah. Well, you are. You're perfect, absolutely perfect, based on the thinking, your thinking, that has made you the way you are. Any questions? <laughs> so you can be perfect, too. So now, how many people here are not perfect? Whew. Oh, still not. Still one taker. Okay, good. You ready for this? You are. Any questions? Oh, good. Because we have been told we're perfect, and we think perfect means ideal. Look it up in Webster. It means whole, complete, nothing missing. Are you whole? Is there anything missing? I know some people who are missing a sense of humor. <laughs> Fortunately, not in this room, but there are some people who don't have a sense of humor. There are some people who don't have a clue. I'm not going to go down that road. <laughs> it's a really good idea. But I would be willing to bet that you have even been encouraged in many ways to embrace an alibi why you're not perfect. Build a story around why you're not perfect. Make up some notion and list of reasons and or, they're really excuses possibly, why you can't do something when in fact you can do anything. I know somebody who was 72 years old and she went back to college to get her master's degree because she decided she wanted to. And she did it. And she didn't take three years, she did it in two. We'll say, well, she didn't have a job. She was retired. <laughs> she had three grandchildren she was raising because mom was working. Two years completed her master's degree in education. Rock! She's my hero. 
So she didn't choose her excuses. So I've shared this quotation here before. You guys may not have been exposed to it. You may not even remember it. It's from one of my favorite shrinks, and that's Eric Hoffer. There are many who find a good alibi far more attractive than an achievement. You chuckle. For an achievement does not settle anything permanently. We still have to prove our worth anew each day. We have to prove that we are as good today as we were yesterday. But when we have a valid alibi for not achieving anything, we're fixed, so to speak, for life. Moreover, when we have an alibi for not writing a book, painting a picture, and so on, we have an alibi for not writing the greatest book and not painting the greatest picture. Small wonder that the effort and I mean, the effort expended and the punishment endured in obtaining a good alibi often exceed the effort and grief requisite for attaining of a most marked achievement. Who's got a good alibi? I want it to be juicy. Anything where the statement says, I can't, fits in this category. Because it's, an, it's a claiming of the fact that you believe, that you know, you're convinced, you're embodying the idea that you don't have the power to do something. I can't is a power statement. And there is no such thing as powerlessness. Great teachers have said, you gave away your power. I say, nonsense. You can't give away your power. You can use your power against yourself. You can use your power in alignment with somebody's story about you. But you are always using your power. You can't not use your power. And neither can you not have a future life. So this afternoon, we're going to dig into the messiness of that. Well, it's going to be messy in the beginning. The second part's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to dig into the messiness of all those ways that you may have up to this point in time chosen, I can't. And then we're going to take that, and we're going to throw it up in the air, and what we'll notice is, just like the shaft from a whole grain of wheat gets picked up by the wind and blows away, you're left with a kernel of truth of who you really are. This magnificent, spectacular, expression of the divine the expression of that pure infinite power the expression of that pure infinite intelligence choosing to be used and choosing to express as the person sitting in that chair called by that name so everything that you've known about yourself we're going to throw it up in the air and see what happens are you willing to suspend your belief long enough to find out what's true are you willing to suspend your precious opinions long enough to find out what's true? And are you willing to suspend your stories long enough to be able to rewrite one, to write another one, to edit the one you've built up to this point in time so as you can move forward in full power, in full experience as that splendid light that you are? You know, people say, God needs you. You get a feeling I have an attitude about that? <laughs> God doesn't need me. God's infinite. I'm in that. We need to shed our light to live. If we don't express who we really are, we are not living. So in what way are you holding back the truth of you? In what way are you not living your future self? Your future self is the current moment from previous decisions. In what way are you not living the new future self of you, the true you, right now? What are you thinking? Because we know that thoughts plus feelings yield demonstrations. So we need to apply our power. Now, there's a character here, a local boy who'd made good, Stephen Covey. And I think the best thing he ever wrote was, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. 
The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. What's the main thing? Well, you might just sort of make up something, but what is the main thing? My personal opinion, and I might have a few, but my personal opinion is that the main thing is the truth of who you really are. Because if you keep the truth of who you really are, you constantly evolve as this constant becoming expression of the true you. You're never living your life based on your interpretation of somebody else's interpretation of who and what you ought to be. Are you up for that? This means yes. Remember, this means no. Are you up for that? Well, then if that's the case, I invite you to try something today. What about you does not satisfy your highest ideal of you? Just let that come to mind. It's right there. It's right there in the back of your forebrain, wanting to come out. So what is that one thing that you most want to express of you that you haven't done yet? Because of potential judgment or criticism or ridicule, people are going to laugh at you. They're going to laugh at you anyway. <laughs> True? If they're not laughing at you, come see me. <laughs> I will teach you how to point and laugh at yourself. Because if you want to move forward faster rather than slower, laugh at yourself sooner rather than later. Ernest Holmes. Now, people, I want you to hear this quotation. It's one of the best things Holmes ever wrote, and he wrote some really, really, really good stuff. This comes out of Living the Science of Mind, and it's the piece called The Study of the Lost Word. You may want to read that whole passage. But he said, if you want a garden, plant one. Now, how does that tie into moving forward or stepping forward as your future you? Well, here you are gathered as a community. This is called a center. We used to call it a church, but it sounded too churchy. You're a center. And when I say you're a center, I mean you are, you are a center. You are the center. It ain't me, it ain't nobody else you hire as your talking head to stand up here and look all pretty and what have you. It ain't that. Your minister, your teacher is not your center. You are. No pressure. <laughs> so this is an invitation for you to find that one piece of light in you that you have not let out. Bring it here. Practice it here. And let this become that infinite expression of that one true expression of life called God, or whatever else you want to call it. So I came across a quotation while at Big Sky, and I really loved it. It's a little minor story. Um, when Jan and I started talking about getting hitched, um, I had... I, it must have been my whole life. I can't remember when, it, when this was not so for me. I had wanted a piece of dirt, like a substantial piece of dirt, one acre if it had greenage, had trees on it, more if it didn't. And I found two acres down in central Tucson with a shell of an adobe house that I gutted, completely remodeled from scratch. New electric, new gas, new septic, the whole nine yards built this thing exactly to my specifications. And in the process, realized that I really love this woman. I thought, cool, here I am. I'm realizing one of my life dreams in finding this property and doing this work. I've always wanted to do this. And I got it finished. And I moved in last June. And I'm really loving my perfect house. And then I realized, I need to ask this woman to marry me. Yikes. So I found out about a month ago, I've been holding this part of me sort of back because I'd gotten, finally I'd gotten something I really wanted. And all of a sudden there was something I wanted. Dang. 
And about a month ago, it came to me that that was a thing I was holding back in our fully being together. So I realized, oh, smokes, I teach. Remember, when you remember what you already know, it gets easier. I teach. The only value of getting something you've really wanted or wanted for a really long time is the proving that you can. And then you can let it go and move on to the next thing. So I decided I'm going to suspend holding on to that particular house and that particular property because if not here, then something way better. So I let it go. Now, I haven't sold it yet. That's to happen. That was an awakening. That was really kind of rough. But the truth of the matter is it freed me up. Now, I didn't realize the impact that that would have on Jan. Bless you. Jan was sitting in a workshop on Monday morning with Mary Morrissey, and she read this particular quote, which is the whole point of this way too long story. Way too long story. And I'm going to lead up to that quote with these statements. Every thought you think has an impact on you. That's what I was sharing about. Think of the vastness of this statement. Every thought you think has an impact on you. Every thought that goes through your mind has an impact on you, on your life, on your health, on your family, on your employment, on how well you sleep, or if you don't. Every thought is the prayer that determines the future you. And every act completes that prayer. So I had my thoughts about this property. I started behaving that way. I bought the thing. I did the major remodel and it completes the prayer. And then, this is the quote, the price of anything is the amount of life you exchange for it. If you wanna move forward as your future you, you will be exchanging something for that. Every man must pay in mental or spiritual coin, said Dr. Holmes for anything that he or she may want. Jan's story, she heard something in Mary's talk. It was this particular quotation. She wrote it down. And she realized that what she wanted more than anything for, was for us to fully be in relationship. So she suggested, after reading Thoreau's quotation, she suggested, well, why don't we just get her married here at Big Sky? And I looked at her because she's been playing hold back, hold back, hold back. I've been really subtle about my hold back. She's been playing hold back, hold back. We've got to get all these logistics lined up and everything else before we can do this. And I was kind of like saying, okay, 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 so be it. And then she asked me this. And I went, you sure? What are your kids going to think? Okay. So the next day, we started making arrangements, and then 24 hours later, we were married with the license. We got the certified copies about 12 hours after that, and we were on our way back to Salt, down here to Salt Lake City. See, what happens when you decide to embrace, embrace the truth of you, the full power of you, the intelligence of you, you move the universe, and no longer are you trapped by conditions. Now, I'm not suggesting you out there may want to get married, but if you don't, that's cool. But I bet there's something in your life that you're using conditions to hold you back. In any way, if there is, this afternoon might be specifically for you. And in the meantime, those of you, the rest of you, I encourage you and invite you this week from today, go find something in your heart and mind that you want to experience, want to be, want to have, and you make one deliberate act in that direction and then follow it with another and then another. And together we shall share this magnificent life in each of us as our true future selves. Bless you. So I guess we're supposed to get all spiritual now and pray, aren't we? Since every thought is a prayer, haven't we been doing that? 
We want to do this in a focused, conscious, a deliberate way instead of just doing the repetitious stuff. And so as I speak, I'm going to speak as that infinite power and intelligence. And I invite each person here to listen as that infinite power and that intelligence. If you're not quite there, you have practitioners here in the room, come see them afterwards and they will help you remember who and what you are. So for now, let's go into that space of the one. One life. One power and one intelligence in that one life. And I know that life as what I will call God's life. I know it as perfect, whole, complete as it is. Nothing could possibly be missing from the one. I also know that that life is my life now. It's the life of every single person in this room, and in fact, it's the life of everything and everyone. So it is with gratitude in my heart that I let my experience of that wholeness vibrate through every cell of this body. I let my experience of that perfection penetrate the mind. I let that peace come forward in my awareness. That harmony express itself in my life. That joy curl up the corners of my mouth. Because I know that that power, that intelligence lives me. It lives as me. And I know that it lives as every single person in this room. What a joy to realize. So I now let my light out, and as I look upon all of life, I see that very light in the, lo in the eyes of every single person I meet, and know this same experience for everyone. So much more light, so much more joy, so much more peace, and absolute wholeness. So feeling complete, I let these words be. I let them go and I let me flow. And together, knowing this together, we affirm it by saying, and so it is. I am so 